Welcome to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. Each week, we feature an episode from the best independent creators. Hit subscribe for more great true crime content. Before we get started, I just wanted to tell you about Scary Time, another podcast by Indie Drop-In featuring independent creators. If you like episodes about the paranormal, ghosts, monsters, hauntings, creepy places, enchanted objects, aliens, and more, check out Scary Time. You can find Scary Time in any podcast app, or you can click the link in the show notes below. All right, let's get to today's true crime episode. Today's episode is from Keystone State of Mind. Keystone State of Mind tells stories of murder and mayhem from the Keystone State, Pennsylvania. If you like today's episode from Keystone State of Mind, make sure to check the show notes for links to subscribe and follow on social media. Enjoy the show. Begin. Hey, Keystoners. Welcome back to Keystone State of Mind. It's me, Steph, your tour guide to the dark side of Pennsylvania. I don't have many announcements today, but I do have to say a big thank you to our newest roadie, Chris W. Chris has been a friend of mine for a while, and he actually hosts his own podcast with his friend Chuck. It's called Weird Candy. They tell strange stories of cryptids and urban legends and crazy mysteries with a little mix of irreverent humor. So be sure to go check out Chris and Chuck on Weird Candy Podcast. I also have a shout out for Keystoner and Rhodey Sunshine for recommending today's topic. And on that note, I have a content warning. There will be some graphic descriptions of gun violence. This is a very small part of the episode, but I always like to make sure you know what you're getting into ahead of time. Okay, so let's do this. Just one thing we have to do before we get started. Let's get into a Keystone State of Mind. As always, I'll be enjoying an ice cold can of Keystone Light while I tell you today's story. On the morning of August 9th, 2007, in Laceyville, Pennsylvania, a horrific crime scene was discovered at the home of Joe and Marlene Colgrove. This discovery was made when a young woman named Amanda showed up at the Colgrove home for a planned appointment. Marlene Colgrove was a gifted quilter, and she had offered to help Amanda make a quilt for her new baby that was due in a few weeks. Amanda was confused and immediately concerned when Marlene didn't answer the door when she knocked. Amanda was also hesitant to enter the house. So she called her father to come over and check things out. Amanda's father entered the Cole Grove home and walked into a living nightmare, a bloodbath. All three residents of the home were dead and police were immediately called. Before we get into who the Cole Grove family was and this murder scene, let's first talk about the town of Laceyville. You may be wondering why Amanda's father was so comfortable just entering this house and why was the door unlocked? Well, that's because Laceyville is a tiny town where everyone knows everyone else. This town has a population of less than 500 people and is a very tight-knit community. The crime rate in Laceyville is nearly zero. As a matter of fact, this is the only violent crime I could find ever committed in Laceyville. I was looking at cityrating.com and it says, quote, The city violent crime rate for Laceyville in 2013 was lower than the national violent crime rate average 
by 100%, end quote. So an incredibly safe, peaceful little town. Laceyville is very near me here in Northern Pennsylvania, about a 30 minute drive from my house in Rome. However, I haven't spent much time there. I have been through Laceyville, that's about it. And that's mainly because there's really nothing to do and no reason to go there unless you live there. There is one bar in Laceyville. It's called the Table Rock Hotel, but it is nicknamed the Tilton Hilton. I'm not sure why. Must be it tilts. The Tilton Hilton has nothing to do with this story, but for some reason I looked at their Google reviews and I was entertained. One review stood out to me because I know the guy who left it. I'm not going to say his name because it's really dumb and I don't know if he listens. Of course, if he does, he's going to know what I'm talking about. But okay, so it was a five-star rating. The review said, friendly bartenders are always friendly. Wow, thanks. That's very helpful. Here's another review. A nice hometown bar. Bar girls are great and friendly. All around good country people. Now, that review is not funny. But what's funny is this guy left a one-star rating. I'm not sure if he understands how ratings work. If you like the place, you give it five stars. Okay, so now we know a little bit about Laceyville and how incredibly uncommon a triple murder is in this small town. So now we can talk about the Colgrove family. Joe Colgrove was 60 years old in 2007. For decades, he had owned and operated the town's only barbershop. The barbershop also kind of served as a gathering place for the guys of Laceyville. Joe had served on the Goodwill Volunteer Fire Department for 42 years, since he was 18 years old. And for 13 of those years, he served as fire chief. Joe was well-known and beloved in Laceyville. Some even considered him the unofficial mayor. Joe's wife, Marlene, was 56. She was a school bus driver for the Wyalusing School District. She'd served alongside Joe in the fire department for many years on the ladies' auxiliary. Marlene was also well-liked in the community, but she was quite outspoken, where Joe was pretty passive and chill. Marlene was quite the opposite, and she was obviously in charge of the family. Marlene was known as someone that you really did not want to piss off. I like her already. Marlene and Joe had three grown sons. Their oldest son, Michael, was 36. At the time of the murders, he had recently returned home to live with his parents due to a newly acquired heart condition. As far as I could find, he had never been married or had any children. And I also couldn't find what he was doing as far as a job. While living with his parents, he volunteered for the local Little League as a coach and an umpire. These three Colgroves were the three murder victims found in the Colgrove home. Joe, Marlene, and oldest son, Michael. Robert was the middle son. At the time of the murders, he was 34 years old. He was married to a woman named Heather and had two sons, Patrick and Andrew. He worked at a local beef processing plant. And if you're from around here, you know what I'm talking about. It's Cargill in Wyalusing. Robert, Heather, and their two sons lived rent-free in a home on the Colgrove property. Heather was a lot like Marlene in the sense that she was outspoken and had a strong personality. For this reason, Heather and Marlene tended to really butt heads often. And last but not least, youngest son, Stephen. At the time, he was 31 years old. He had recently left the Air Force after serving 12 years. He briefly returned to Laceyville before moving to Deposit, New York, to take a job with a cable company. 
in deposit. He didn't get his own place, but he actually moved in with a friend of his and his friend's wife. He had his own room in their home. According to family friend Eric Eberlin, Stephen was quite a bit different than his brothers. He excelled in sports. He was popular and charming and very good looking. And because of his time in the armed forces, he was known as a hometown hero. I'm not sure what this family friend was trying to say about the other two brothers. If Stephen was so different because he was attractive, charming, and popular, did that mean the other brothers were not? I don't know. To everyone that knew them, the Colgrove family seemed very tight-knit, very close, Just a normal American small town family. But in the spring of 2007, it was obvious to everyone in Laceyville that a rift had developed between the members of the Quillgrove family. It all started when Robert and Heather decided to adopt a little girl named Brianna. She wasn't a baby. I'm not sure exactly how old she was at the time of this adoption. There's also no public information on the circumstances that led up to this adoption. I'm going to take a minute here to tell you about my main source for this episode. It was an investigation discovery show called Blood Relatives, season two, episode one. I hate using investigation discovery shows as sources because it is so dramatized and often ridiculous. And this show was no different. Totally lived up to ID's reputation of just being sensationalistic. And the way they portrayed Laceyville as a town was laughable. The show portrayed it as this, almost like a small city, which it is not like beautiful fountains and brick-built churches. No offense to Laceyville, but it does not look like that. Manicured lawns and all of this. No, not at all. The show's portrayal and how Laceyville actually looks could not have been more different. And I was annoyed. Like, can you, why didn't they just shoot some of this in fucking Laceyville. I know they went there because at the very end of the show, they did have a shot of Laceyville from the other side of the Susquehanna River. So I know they were there. They also had a photo of the Colgrove's grave sites. They saw what it looked like. How could you then make it so fucking different Like, the story is interesting enough without adding fake-ass visual bullshit. I, I was pissed, kind of. Like, this is so dumb. And you watch these shows about small towns or whatever, you don't realize how fictionalized they are unless you actually know what these places look like. And it, it irked me. I'll leave it at that. Okay, rant over. Robert and Heather decided to adopt a little girl named Brianna. I don't know how old she was, but the blood relative show portrayed her as like, I don't know, six or seven, probably. They also had her dress the entire episode as an angel in a white dress with wings and a halo. So fucking dumb. Whatever. One last thing about the show, and I promise I'll be done, but they had... They kept zooming in on this tarantula crawling all over the place. We do not have wild fucking tarantulas around here. It made no sense and had no bearing on the plot at all. Investigation discovery can kiss my ass. All right, now I'm really done. Robert and Heather adopt Brianna, age and circumstances unknown. This whole situation infuriated Marlene. She and Joe were already providing much of the financial support for Robert's family, and Marlene did not approve of taking on another mouth to feed. She refused to accept Brianna into the family and blatantly gave her the cold shoulder. 
this is very strange to me. I understand the financial situation, but this is a child who obviously needed a home. This also could be Marlene's first granddaughter. And it's not like Joe and Marlene were hurting financially. Joe had a very successful business in his barbershop, and Marlene worked as a bus driver. I get that you don't want to have to support your grown children and their family, but something's fucking not right here. It makes me wonder if there is more to this story, if there's something else that makes Marlene despise this child, or if it really is just Marlene's need for control over her family. Either way, Robert and Heather were furious at the way Marlene acted towards Brianna. So they moved out. They moved off the Colgrove property and got their own place in nearby Camp Town. Marlene was not one to keep her business to herself and keep her mouth shut, so she told anyone that would listen that she cut Robert out of the will and he would get $1 when she died. Heather, being equally as vindictive, cut Marlene off from seeing her grandchildren. Well, the ones that she actually liked, the boys. This whole situation boiled over when Marlene showed up to the boys' Little League game. A screaming match ensued between Heather and Marlene, and the umpire had to eject both of them from the field. And guess who the umpire was? Oldest son, Michael. How fucking embarrassing. You're umpiring a Little League game, and your mother and sister-in-law nearly throw dukes. Michael realized then that this situation was out of control and he needed to get the family together to try and figure this out. So youngest son, Stephen, came back to Laceyville to sit down with everybody in the Colgrove family and try to work it out. No dice. Neither Marlene or Heather would relent. Emotions were running way too high at that point to forgive and forget. This brings us to the morning of August 9th, 2007. The young pregnant woman, Amanda, showed up to the Colgrove home so Marlene could help her with her baby's quilt. Amanda immediately knew something was wrong when Marlene didn't come to the door. The Colgroves were very reliable. It was not like Marlene at all to forget about an appointment. Amanda may have thought that Mrs. Colgrove was sick or hurt inside and needed help. But what Amanda didn't know is that across town, Joe's barbershop remained closed. He had never showed up to open a shop. When Amanda's father entered the home and saw all the blood in the upstairs bedroom, he quickly left the scene and called police. But what police would find was unimaginable. This is where we're going to get into some of the gory details. For the next couple of minutes, make sure you're not eating. All three victims were shot in the head with a 12-gauge shotgun. Police recovered six empty shotgun shells, three-inch magnum birdshot. The first homicide investigators on the scene were James Carrick and George Confer. And the first room they examined was Michael's. Michael was laying in his bed with his face blown off. There was blood everywhere, on every surface. And that wasn't all that investigators noticed. I have a quote here from Detective Confer. Quote, the shotgun blast had actually taken the brain out of his head and placed it on the bookshelf behind him. End quote. Next, detectives went to Joe's room. Joe was in his bed with his head blown off and there's blood everywhere. I have another quote from Detective Confer. Quote, His hand was gripping the bed rail 
underneath where his head would have been. End quote. From there, they went on to Marlene's room. Apparently, Joe and Marlene had separate bedrooms. When you've been married that long, you probably need separate bedrooms. Marlene was found on the floor of her bedroom. She had apparently been woken by the other shotgun blasts because she had a defensive wound. She must have held her hand up and the first shot hit her hand and blew off to her fingers. The second shot was to her head and she was killed instantly. It was evident to detectives that after this, the killer went back and shot both Joe and Michael again. And that's why there was so much blood. Joe and Michael had been bleeding and dying. And when the killer went back and shot them a second time each in the head, it sent so much more blood spatter all over every surface. Investigation of the exterior of the house revealed that the phone lines had been cut. This was an obvious attempt to keep the victims from calling for help if they were awoken from any of the shotgun blasts. Now, this is 2007, so they potentially had cell phones, but I can attest that in this area, there is no cell phone service, not even now in 2021. I rely on Wi-Fi and a landline at my house. Can we get some more cell towers in Bradford County? Please. Police also found that a pane of glass in an exterior door had been broken out. This was made to look as if somebody had broken the pane of glass, reached in, and unlocked the door. But of course, all the shards of glass were found on the outside of the door. So whoever broke the glass broke it from inside. This was meant to look like a burglary, a robbery. But everybody knows if you're gonna fucking do that, break the glass from outside, you stupid ass. Why are killers so dumb? We all know that if you want to stage a robbery when you're murdering someone, you need to break the glass from the outside, so the shards of glass are on the inside. Hello? This obviously told investigators that someone gained access in a different way. Most likely, a key, because there were no other signs of forced entry. The only people who had a key to the Cole Grove home were family members. And this made sense to detectives because that second shot to both Joe and Michael was overkill. Hatred, anger, a random intruder is not going to have those emotions. Police spoke with neighbors trying to find a witness, but this is a rural area. People do not live close together. And the night before had been a terrible storm. The thunder was so loud that no one would have been able to discern a shotgun blast from the thunder. But they did find one witness with some useful information. This was a waitress at a diner near the Colgrove's home. This waitress came in to open the diner at 4 a.m., And when she got there, she noticed a white truck speeding down the road that the Colgroves lived on. She took notice to this because at 4 a.m. in this small town, there's very little traffic, most certainly not on this side road. And this vehicle was traveling at a high rate of speed. So it made an impression on her, and she was able to relay this to detectives when they asked. Well, guess who owns a white pickup truck? Robert and Heather. Investigators are also hearing about the feud between Marlene and Heather. So Robert is an obvious suspect. 
his demeanor when he was interviewed did not help him one bit. When Robert was notified about his family's murder, he literally just said, okay. He had no reaction and he never asked how they were killed. Heather and Robert were each other's alibi. They were just home together. This is not an acceptable alibi for police. Robert agreed to take a polygraph, but the results were inconclusive. Heather, when she was interviewed, downplayed the feud. She made it like the family was great and she loved Marlene and Joe. She had no problem with anyone in the Colgrove family. Robert had a bunch of shotguns in his house and they were all confiscated to be analyzed. In the meantime, Stephen came back to Laceyville to arrange funeral services for his parents and his brother. Family friend Eric Eberlin, who we mentioned before, spoke to Stephen. And Stephen had been crying. He was red faced, his eyes were bloodshot. And Eberlin was just saying, I don't understand this. I don't know how this could have happened. I'm so sorry. And Stephen just cried. He was distraught and emotional. Police interviewed him and he had an alibi. He was in deposit in New York. That's a couple of hours away. Stephen told investigators about the family feud and about Robert and Heather and how angry they were. Stephen kind of started to point the finger at his brother, Robert, and police believed him. They thought they had their man. Robert had to have been the killer. But they still have to dot their T's and cross their I's or whatever. Stephen was asked to take off his shirt. Investigators wanted to see if he had any bruising on his shoulders that could be caused from a shotgun kickback. They really did not expect to see anything. They thought Robert was their guy and Stephen was the morning brother. Stephen readily pulled down the left side of his shirt and he had no bruise. Investigators asked to see the right side. And he said, well, I shoot left-handed, so I wouldn't have a bruise on the right side. And they're like, yeah, but we should probably see it anyway. So he showed them the right side and he had a big old bruise. Stephen said, oh, wait, wait. Yeah. Oh, I remember now. I fell up the stairs and jammed my shoulder. That's what that's from. Yeah, I, I just fell up the stairs. Yeah. Immediately, the detectives are rethinking their position on Robert being the killer. Stephen is looking real suspicious at this point. Police had also recently learned that Stephen was faking a cancer diagnosis. He had told everyone that he had colon cancer and was seeking treatment at a hospital near his home in deposit. Well, police called that hospital and found out that there was no such patient by the name of Stephen Colgrove. When investigators confronted Stephen with this evidence, he admitted to it. He said, yeah, I've been lying. I needed help financially. I needed some place to stay. I just told everybody I had cancer so I could get some help. Now the detectives need to travel to Deposit, New York to have a look at where Stephen's been living and talk to the people that he's been living with. Stephen has been staying rent-free with his friend, Robert Rainierson. So the detectives talked to Rainierson and they said, tell us about Stephen. What's been going on? Rainierson says, Stephen's going through a rough time. He's got cancer. We've been letting him stay with us. So he's closer to the hospital so he can get his treatments. 
The detectives then told Robert, Stephen doesn't have cancer. He's been lying. He admitted to it. And Rainierson was pissed. He's like, are you fucking kidding me? I This guy's been living with us for like a year saying that he has cancer. At this point, Rainierson gives detectives free reign. Search whatever you want. The first thing they wanted to search was a white pickup truck that was sitting in the driveway. And when they looked in the pickup truck, there was a 12-gauge shotgun sitting in there. Rainierson said, yeah, I bought that gun. I keep it in the truck. I've never used it. The gun was confiscated, and it was found to have been fired. Not only that, there was a drop of blood found inside the barrel of this Mossberg 12-gauge. Upon further examination, that blood was proven to be Michael Colgrove's. And that gun was ballistically proven to be the one that fired the shots into Joe, Marlene, and Michael Colgrove. Stephen Colgrove was arrested and charged with three counts of first-degree murder. Investigators believe that when Stephen learned that Robert had been pushed out of the will, that that was his opportunity to take out everyone else and get the Colgrove family wealth. Now, earlier we talked about how the Colgroves, they weren't hurting for money, but they weren't wealthy. The only thing that Stephen would have inherited was his mother's $100,000 life insurance policy. Stephen was convicted on all counts and given three life sentences. But there's a little bit more to this story. It was later determined that Stephen was not Joe Colgrove's biological son. No one knows if Joe or Stephen knew this. And just one last bummer. On May 20th, 2013, Robert Colgrove, age 40, was killed in a car accident on his way to work. His obituary mentioned Brianna as his daughter. So, that's the story of the Colgrove family murders of Laceyville, PA. What a dick that Stephen. Of course, he's tried to appeal numerous times and they've been unsuccessful. Deuces, family annihilator. Anyway, I hope you guys have a good week. We'll talk again soon. And in the meantime, stay Keystone, my friends. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. If you would like your show featured, reach out to us at Indie Drop-In on all social media or go to IndieDropIn.com. See you next time.